So I will tell about uh, collaborations, that being the th uh, theme of this, uh, uh, this session. Uh, academy industry collaborations, but it's really mostly academy industry industry collaborations. So the uh, part with, between industries is just uh, as, as important. Uh, so I'm uh, basing this uh, pr uh, uh, presentation on two examples. Uh, both work uh, on the same technology, but are uh, 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 constructed very differently. Uh, one, uh, the uh, Graphene flagship, is uh, a 10-year project uh, funded uh, 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 by the European Commission, also funded by the member states, but I will focus on the Commission-funded part. So from the, from the Commission, uh, uh, we have thus far received about 400 million euros. I'm the coordinator, so I know that part reasonably well. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, there is a Swedish national program called CEO uh, Graphene, which also runs uh, uh, for uh, uh, roughly 10 years. It has a smaller budget. It gets about, uh, has gotten about 20 million euros uh, from the uh, Swedish funding agencies, but the partners have uh, uh, pitched in about as much. And uh, that uh, program is coordinated by Elisabeth Saxton Beck, who sits in the, uh, in the room uh, from uh, Chalmers Industry Technique. And I promised the chairman that I'll, I'll be quick, so you know, and he promised to give me a warning at the four minute uh, remaining mark, so we'll uh, proceed from there. So as a comparison between these two programs, uh, uh, they are rather different. So the flagship uh, is a, has European focus. We do both research and innovation. Uh, we have a single contract uh, with the European Commission signed by uh, all the partners uh, and the commission. And uh, it's a very large partnership, probably one of the bigger partnerships that the Commission uh, uh, has, because we have about 170 partners uh, today, very evenly split between the commercial and non-commercial partners. So uh, about one third of our partners are large companies, the ones like uh, Airbus uh, or uh, BASF or Nokia and uh, Ericsson and so on. Uh, about 16% are small and medium-sized enterprises. So that's the commercial half, uh, the uh, non-commercial half uh, uh, comprises research institutes such as Fraunhofer uh, uh, and uh, uh, academic partners such as, uh, uh, well, Chalmers University of Technology and a bunch of other universities. Uh, the f uh, flagship works uh, on a very wide range of technology readiness levels from very beginning and from fundamental research to uh, about uh, TRL-8. And um, our work is divided into work packages, which are in turn divided into tasks, and they have each rather substantial budget. So a typical task might have a budget of 1 million euros, and then we have something that is on high TRL, and they're called spearhead projects, they have a, a budget of about 4 million. And typically in a spearhead or a task, there are 4 to 10 different partners involved, each running about 3 years. and. Uh, uh, basically, uh, 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 the uh, applied research activities can be continued, but the spearheads, they stop after three years. This is to be contrasted uh, with the uh, CEO Graphene, which is a national program. It's fully focused on innovation, no real sort of research component. Uh, it's uh, a program that uh, comprises a number of uh, projects, which are rather small, between 30,000 and maybe 250,000 uh, euros. So the project portfolio is, uh, is huge, and altogether there have been about 220 uh, uh, projects uh, which uh, are attracting a lot of SMEs, also quite a few large companies, not so many uh, academic partners, which is consistent with, with they do. The project sizes are smaller and the duration is, uh, is uh, shorter than is in the flagship. Uh, okay. Let's try to push the right button. So uh, this is uh, uh, sort of what we do. Uh, uh, all these pictures are the work packages of the uh, uh, Graphene flagship. So we deal everything between enabling research to uh, production and uh, all kinds of technologies in between. In some boxes, you see uh, uh, markers uh, as CO Graphene. So CO Graphene works, for instance, on energy technologies, uh, electronics, uh, biomedicine uh, production and composites. So you see that for CO graphene, it tends to be uh, the somewhat more advanced or applied topics rather. In, uh, in addition to these uh, work packages uh, in the uh, uh, graphene flagship, we have also uh, a whole bunch of these high technology readiness uh, projects that we call spearhead projects. I don't want to go through all of them. There were 
uh, talks by uh, Stein Gosens and Antonio Agresti yesterday uh, on uh, two of these things. There was also, uh, we also have this experimental pilot line that was described by Inge Asselberg uh, yesterday, so I will not uh, cover those parts. But one example that I think is particularly interesting here is this uh, air filters one, because that has gone the entire way from very fundamental research. In the beginnings, uh, there we had a group of researchers in Kiel who worked on something called uh, irographene, which is basically a foam made of graphene, and it was you know, the most basic of basic research. Uh, then uh, they could show that this material could be heated extremely rapidly at the rate of 300,000 degrees per second. So one millisecond raises the temperature of the material by 300 degrees. And then Lufthansa got interested that, you know, this is something that we can use in air filters uh, in our Airbus 321 planes. And now they, have, uh, uh, they are very far along developing new kinds of more efficient smaller air filters uh, for their commercial planes. Uh, this kind of a thing would not be possible uh, in a short project. It takes a long time uh, to get, uh, get to the results. Uh, maybe uh, for the local uh, interest, uh, I could mention circuit breakers. Uh, ABB is working on uh, uh, circuit breakers that do not need to be lubricated. So they don't need to be visited and by a technician once a year, uh, which would save tremendous amounts of money. Uh, that uh, is based on uh, uh, graphene metal uh, composites uh, that uh, have uh, very good properties. So uh, how are we uh, performing? How are these two projects performing? Uh, the KPIs are a little different. I know better the uh, flagship ones. So by now, uh, we have uh, our partners have been granted more than 80 patents. Uh, we have applied, I don't know, 300 or 400 patents, which is 13 times more than the Commission would expect uh, us to do based on the amount of funding that we receive. The Commission has a target of one patent application per 10 million euros of funding. We exceed that uh, by a factor of about 13 to 14. Uh, when it comes to scientific publications, we have more than 5,000. That's about seven times more than what we should have based on our funding. Uh, we've been uh, cited a little bit just over a quarter of a million times. Uh, we have uh, well over 100 products on the market and we have launched uh, 17 spin-offs. I think on the next page I have a picture of the spin-off. For the geography, the KPIs are a bit different. Uh, uh, the uh, projects have resulted in 12 new products uh, on the market. 220 companies have participated in, uh, in at least uh, one project and uh, 10 uh, new spin-off companies have participated in projects. So I think both of the programs have proven to be very successful in, in their own way, despite the fact that they have been uh, set up a, a bit uh, differently. Uh, uh, these are the, uh, well, most of the spin-off companies uh, that uh, have come out of the Graphene flagship. I don't think I had uh, everybody's logo. But uh, one way of measuring success is that these companies have managed to attract well over 130 million euros uh, external funding. And that is perhaps the best uh, success indicator because that shows that somebody is willing to put their own money uh, into this thing. Uh, and uh, thank you for the four minute uh, mark. I think we are doing extremely well here. Uh, uh, so uh, that I think is the kind of KPI that one should have. That's a meaningful KPI. It takes a long time to measure it, but if you can measure it, uh, that, that is the real thing. Uh, so what have we learned uh, in this, uh, 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 during these exercises? Uh, clearly, uh, the most important uh, learning uh, is uh, that the long project period is paramount. It's absolutely crucial. It takes time to transfer knowledge from academia to industry, uh, in particular when you are talking about a completely new field like these two-dimensional uh, materials. And it takes time because it takes time to build trust. People need to trust each other and they need to trust the new technology. Uh, another thing that I mentioned yesterday in one comment is that you have to start thinking about industrialization early, long before it, it is like a realistic possibility. You have to identify that things like standardization, making sure that things are uh, safe both for the uh, employees and for the consumers, everything uh, like that takes time. Uh, you need to also be able to identify win-win situations. And typically what, uh, the way we phrase that is that 
academic partners are often quite good at uh, saying what is doable, whereas the industrial partners are much better at saying what is worth doing. And if you can find uh, something that is both doable and worth doing, everybody uh, is happy and th that results uh, success from this inter intersection. Uh, Active outreach is important, and that is something that uh, CEO Graphene has been excellent in doing. There were not very many Swedish companies 10 years ago who uh, uh, had learned about Graphene. So uh, uh, with the active uh, outreach, we could bring in uh, uh, many more, or rather Elizabeth could bring in many more. We have done the same thing in the flagship, but the dynamics in the flagship is slower, so it has to go uh, uh, a little differently. Uh, Project size is also important. Small projects uh, tend to attract more uh, SMEs, perhaps out of necessity, because the SMEs need the uh, 50,000 euros to be able to survive the next half year. Uh, the large companies, they don't bother uh, writing a proposal if the, the payback is 50,000 euros. Uh, the, uh, also in Europe, it's particularly important to uh, think of projects or at least programs that integrate the entire value chains, because we do not uh, have the com companies like Samsung that uh, take do everything from materials to components to systems. We have companies like BASF that are extremely good world leading in materials. We have companies uh, like Airbus uh, that is very good at integrating things together. Uh, but uh, in order to make a, a difference, uh, we need to uh, work together. Uh, finally, uh, one uh, should realize that uh, new technologies come uh, with a high level of risk and uh, public funding is uh, absolutely necessary to uh, get over this uh, valley of death that uh, some people already mentioned uh, and uh, get from the sort of ideas that work in the lab, uh, work on the small scale, to the uh, situation uh, uh, where uh, uh, the uh, uh, endeavor is uh, self-sustaining in terms of uh, profits. And I think with that, I will actually stop and uh, give the word back to the chairman. Thank you so much. So at this stage, let me invite back the, all three speakers to the stage. I think some of you are still equipped. There is also more microphone here. You can pick that. Yeah. Right. So, uh, Open for questions and discussion. Where do we start? I'm down, uh, but what about China? I mean, uh, how do we talk to China? What do we do? I mean, we should collaborate, shouldn't we? What do you say about that? Uh, any particular person you are addressing your question to? Maybe, uh, maybe our chairman. I, mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could comment on it. I mean, uh, there is, of course, a very competitive China out there, having enormous uh, investments, very high ambitions. Uh, I think it was a little bit single-sided, maybe, to talk about the connections to, you know, military and defense. I mean, I happen to have followed for 60 years strategic material, strategic device development in the U.S. I've been part of it myself, actually. That's totally dominated by DARPA and, and the military, controlling it and getting access to all the research. Uh, I don't. Uh, I just looked up. I think most of you have read this book called uh, "Chip War" by Chris Miller. Very readable book. I will recommend it to everyone. Where you can see that the whole Gordon Moore's the, the Moore's development was indeed to 90, 95 percent controlled by and funded by DARPA. So I mean, there's nothing new that also China is doing similar things. I can conclude saying that maybe I think it would be great if Europe could stay out of this maybe a little bit low level of controlling science and technology and make Europe a non-military, super high-tech continent. Yeah, I, I would just uh, throw in there, I 100% uh, agree with you. The things that China are doing now are things that every great power who is rising has done. Uh, you know, the United States did this when it was rising against Great Britain, uh, everything from uh, stealing trade secrets and uh, patents and incorporating them into uh, uh, our domestic economies. So it's not that surprising that they're doing it. I don't even fault them for it. Um, it with respect to the US, there is no doubt that um, the primary funder of research and innovation is the Defense Department. They do it for obviously strategic reasons. 
so that they're right at the bleeding edge. TRL8. Anyone else like to comment on this? But we have a cooperation in some projects uh, with uh, China, but uh, of course now we are checking uh, more when they are participating. They most of the cases we don't give funds if I'm not wrong. It's the Chinese uh, government who covers. So we accept a Chinese beneficiary because of the knowledge, because of the background, because of the experience. But in most of the cases, it's the Chinese who should pay the contribution. We don't give funds. But uh, Peter, you dealt, uh, I ask your help, because you are <laughs> we are just implementing what you decide. <laughs> but that's a way, because we gain in this international cooperation also. You should also look oh, at absolutely. that aspect. Yari? Uh, yeah, in, uh, in the flagship we have international collaborations with uh, uh, Japan, Korea, China, uh, Australia, uh, the US, uh, also with uh, Singapore. And uh, I must say that collaboration with China has become more difficult. Uh, we uh, intentionally limit these collaborations to lower TRL levels, to the academic domain. Uh, I think the only exception has really been in Korea, where we have had some, uh, some companies uh, uh, present. Uh, Lars uh, pointed out that both in the US uh, and in China uh, defense uh, has been a key factor in making uh, in particular uh, electronics uh, industry develop. Uh, that is not the case in Europe uh, and uh, uh, I don't know if it always needs to continue to Which be Which is what I suggested. Yeah. Let's keep it on another level for excellence development in Europe. And not yeah, but it, it, mm. is that realistic? It's not like uh, uh, Europe is a, a peaceful continent uh, right now. So maybe we need to uh, uh, realize... Uh, we have, uh, have awareness, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I would just say, uh, I study geopolitics for fun. Don't ask me why. Um, but what you see uh, uh, amongst allies, right? is usually there first comes an alignment on foreign policy issues, trade issues, and then eventually over time, especially if you truly are uh, running up to a potential conflict, it trickles down to every facet of how governments interact. And so I do, I do wonder, and I don't have uh, any real insight here, is can you preserve research and innovation collaboration between Europe and China without uh, uh, having to get aligned with the United States or work with the United States, because they will apply pressure, let's face it. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, maybe you want to say something on that? Uh. <laughs> I, I, think, I think there is no way <laughs> to avoid the fact that maybe China today is even ahead of US and Europe in many areas of science. There was this article in May 